Hello and welcome back and that is right. Today I'm going to continue talking about SSDs designed for NAS. For those that aren't aware, a lot of the brands that we've been seeing in the last year or so, although they've been a huge focus towards flash and gaming and stuff like that, a lot of SSD development has started to get larger and larger quarter on quarter towards servers from the likes of Synology and QNAP, but of course big highfalutin high tier enterprise level flash stuff. They've all been working on SSDs that are kind of designed to be utilized in these incredibly intense environments. What was once the purview of just kind of enterprise data center type stuff, we're now seeing more and more SSDs with higher durability and sustained uh, performance to be utilized alongside NASes that are on for days, weeks, months, or even years at a time. So it is unsurprising that two of the biggest uh, media vendors in the world, Seagate and WD, have their own NAS optimized SSDs. But it should be said that they didn't all arrive at the same time. Indeed, these two I have here in front of me, although they're here in the studio right now in October 2021 at time of recording, I've got to say that this one here has been around since March 2020. This drive here, the Ironwolf 510 from Seagate, is their first generation NAS NVMe SSD. As in, as mentioned, arriving early in March 2020, it was designed for brands like Synology and QNAP that have either got dedicated M2 NVMe bays inside or PCIe upgrade slots. They allow you to pop cards in to upgrade your number of storage bays to include M2 NVMe allowing you to either utilize these for individual storage pools or for caching, more impor importantly, to bolster the performance of your NAS hard drives. Once you've got a bunch of hard drives in a NAS, which are great for overall price per terabyte, overall capacity available to you, unfortunately, they have lower overall performance. And as more and more users connect with the data on a NAS and take advantage of larger connections, such as 10 GBE, fiber channel-based connections, SAN-based connectivity, a lot of those hard drives are showing their limitations and utilizing a couple of M2 NVMEs in conjunction with that for caching, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail later on in those versions, allow that extra performance to come through without completely upgrading the overall storage from hard drives over to SSD. Now, the WD entry here is known as the SN700. Now, their NVMe SSD arrived in October 2021, just a few weeks before this video has been made. And the, although they already had uh, SSDs for NAS already in the market, such as the SA500, this is the first time they've entered the NVMe market, and it's with a very, very solid entry. So between these two, there's about a year and a half difference between their individual releases. So we expected there to be a lot of difference between them, but not as much as there is. And in today's video, I'm gonna talk about their key differences and ultimately which one deserves your money, your data, your cash, whatever. So let's go into a little bit more about the specifics of the architecture of these two drives. Because the Seagate came out first, we'll start with that. Now this is the Seagate Ironwall 510. It arrives with the Fizon E12 controller, which is kind of showing its age a little bit now. In 2021, when Fizon are now onto the E18, and even talking about their PCIe Gen 5 E26 in some places. It arrived with 64 layer 3D TLC NAND, that's coaxia NAND, and it arrives with an architecture of PCIe 1.3 revision. Uh, I'm sorry, a PCIe Gen 3 times 4 NVMe 1.3 revision. On top of that, the real standout moment for this is that durability. Arriving with a durability of between 0 0.9 and 1.0 drive rights per day, it means you can effectively almost completely refresh the data on this drive every single day and it will still maintain that lifespan uh, that reported uh, lifespan and workload of this drive and that sustained performance it has it also has five years of manufacturer's warranty and it arrives with three years of data recovery services that i'll talk about in a little bit more detail later on it also arrives with um, four capacities at 240 gig 480 gig 960 gig and 1.92 gig uh, 1.92 terabytes now that sounds really weird in terms of storage capacities and that's because it factors in over provisioning into those storage values now moving forward we don't see that many of those odd capacity drives because over provisioning is kind of factored into the build of the ssds so even now when you see a drive these days that's 500 gig chances are it's actually inside there two nand modules at 256 gigabytes each and that extra bit of storage capped on the top there, some of that has gone towards OP. Or it's just 
not utilized to its full capacity there. Now, if we look at the WD Red SN700, we see a much more advanced modern drive. The controller is utilizing WD's own latest generation in-house NVMe controller. Again, this is a PCIe Gen 3 x 4 SSD as well. It arrives with 96 layer SanDisk 3D TLC NAND. So again, higher layer density will generally mean better performance as well as improving other parameters as well. It takes advantage of NVMe revision 1.3 as well, but the drive rights per day it goes from uh, 0.7 drive rights per day on the larger capacities there of 2 and 4 TB. That's right, there's a 4 TB version. And it goes at um, 1.0 drive rights per day. That's full drive data refresh there on the 250, 500 gig and 1 TB model. So five overall capacities between them there. So a lot of capacities open to you there. Um, a better quality of NAND. And ultimately, this should be a better drive anyway, long term. And it kind of proves that. And again, with those hard drive capacities, it's worth touching on the price. And the price between them currently, looking at Amazon as of like a week ago, Amazon.com, we can see £69, £110, £200 and £400 for each of those capacities scaling upwards. Whereas on the WD Red, we see um, uh, 80 pound, um, $80 for the 500 gig model and then 145 289 and 649 uh, for the capacity up to 4 TB. I couldn't get a standard price on the 250 gig at the time of recording, but I think we can scale it around 40 to 50 pounds at the very most. So again, if we look at say the 1 TB for example there between them, certainly the WD is cheaper. Seagate have kind of priced this quite expensively and it's not come down in price a great deal since its launch. So even though this drive is you know, close to a year and a half older, it's still technically more expensive, which is really weird. Now, particularly given that Seagate have released a newer generation NAND SSD, here, the PCIe Gen 4 Ironwall 525, one would assume that that is going to replace this, or it should have already, but no, they're both readily available, and it looks like neither one of them is going, any, uh, the old one isn't going anywhere else very anytime soon so right now certainly in terms of overall capacity and price per terabyte it's very hard to ignore that this is definitely the better value drive between them and its architecture given it's a newer drive as well it has a better NAND quality there and almost certainly a better controller even if WD are slightly more resistant to give away a lot of their in-house tech on their controller, it should be said that it's certainly going to be better than the Fazon E12, given its age within their own revisions of drives. So let's move away from a little bit of the pricing and that architecture and talk about the impact of that. We've got both of these drives here. We have tested them already on previous videos. We can certainly say that in terms of throughput and performance, it will come as no surprise at all that the WD Red SN700 is a much, much, much higher performing SSD overall. And not by any small margin either there. Now, the Iron Wolf 510 arrives with a reported sequential read at the highest, uh, highest tier across all the capacities of 3,150 megabytes per second sequential read. Sequential write, on the other hand, is just 1,000 maximum, and that's the highest amongst all the capacities. If you go to the lower capacities, it's actually slower than that. And indeed, IOPS on that are reported at 345,000 IOPS in 4K read, uh, and in write, 28,000. Very, very low indeed. And remember, that's the highest of the four available capacities there. The SN700, on the other hand, has a reported sequential read maximum of 3,430. So higher, but not a huge amount higher. And again, that's because of the bandwidth of PCIe Gen 3 times 4 But the sequential read of 3,100 absolutely demolishes this drive over three times the sequential write. It is impossible to ignore that you are getting better performance in and out on this drive of sequential big data. Even in IOPS, with a reported 515,000 read 4K IOPS and 560,000 4K write IOPS, it just wins. It's practically doubling in every single meaningful way and tripling in some cases with the uh, sequential write. Now, how does that translate into utilization on a NAS? Why is that important? Well, 
when you look at these NAS systems, when it comes down to caching, although there are lots of different kinds of caching to be utilized in a NAS system, there are two fairly clear options. There's your read caching and your write caching. Yes, they divulge into slightly different ones, write back, write cache, uh, read over, etc. We're just gonna focus on the uh, kind of meat and potatoes of it there. Now in read caching, that is when you have one or more SSDs aligned inside this system alongside a bunch of hard drives there and the system sees what is the data that's being most frequently accessed what is the data that is most important what is it being more frequently accessed by individual clients or even one client that data be it metadata any files config files or even slightly larger will then be copied over to the ssds and therefore future system requests for that data by clients will then be taken from the ssd not the NAS system. And it doesn't move the data, it copies the data. Over time, as the accessing trends of the user and the connected client users um, change, the data on the cache will then change as well. If data isn't accessed for a period, it's then removed and maybe other data will be cached onto it. But ultimately, the amount of data being cached on it will scale in accordance with the hard drives that are inside and read caching Obviously, it's going to re require much better read, uh, write, uh, 4K read um, IOPS rating there for the much, much smaller files, but sequential plays its part as well because some NASs like QNAP allow you to uh, better configure the cached data and it allows you to uh, maybe opt for a much more uh, VM-centric IO based on that caching algorithm, particularly because a lot of the more enterprise-level uh, QNAPs and even high-end SMB are utilizing ZFS now, which does an even better job of uh, metadata handling and cache data handling. And Synology's DSM-7 even allows you to pin metadata so it never leaves the cache either, even if you don't come back to it for a while. Now, obviously, when it comes to read, caching, both of these SSDs are gonna be all right, but there's no denying it. That slight advantage this has in sequential read and a massive advantage it has in 4K read IOPS means it's a better choice overall there. Particularly when you look at that 500 gig, sorry, the 250, the 500 gig and the one TB, all having identical um, drive rights per day as that of the Seagate there. Now, when it goes to the larger capacity, yes, the uh, drive rights per day drops to 0 0.7 on that WD, but having that 4 TB option is going to be really useful given that modern hard drives are now at 18 TB with 20 TBs just slightly on the horizon there. So again, it's a clear win in terms of read caching there for the WD Red over that of the Seagate Ironwolf. Now, when it comes to write IOPS, for those that aren't aware, write IOPS are when you've got those same SSDs working with the system. However, when data is being sent from client devices or servers or sites or anything in small or big and it's going to the NAS, the data is written to the SSDs. Then in the background, it's moved onto the larger hard drive array. Now, obviously, this means that having high write performance, be it in both IOPS and sequential, is beneficial. Therefore, this drive here is an absolute stone cold winner there because of that high write performance throughout. You can have situations where you have combined read write IOPS, a lot of people do when you have at least two SSDs. And again, that means you can get take advantage of both, and therefore the WD red combo in a pair is going to be very advantageous. However, one thing that a lot of people overlook is the Seagate series does have data recovery service. It's known as their rescue service. You get three years of data recovery there. Now, most users would be keen to highlight who needs that. I'm taking advantage of uh, the NAS's RAID capabilities. I've got backup capabilities. And also, with data being spread and cache data being copies of data, why would I need data recovery? Well, if you're using write caching, that means, in some instances, you don't know the data that's going there has made it onto the hard drives. <clears throat> Some data that's being sent to the system may be purely unique, such as surveillance data, such as website data, transactional data. And if there's fundamental power failure, system critical failure or more, there's every possibility that that data has moved over to the right cache, but has not fully made it to the hard drives inside. And in that scenario, data recovery would be exceptionally useful and the bigger the business, ultimately, the more money that data is worth. And having free 
forensic level data recovery services should not be overlooked. So, although in this comparison, let's face it, WD has still ultimately won practically every single round here, I do think the data recovery service option there, a number of you, particularly you, those of you who look at buying memory for your PC, your laptop, or your course, your servers, that look at memory and go, oh, I'll spring for the extra, I'll get the ECC memory, um, error code correction or error correcting code memory, because you know the value of lost, not so much the data, but the value of lost data. So again, do keep an eye on our data recovery services, but ultimately it may come as no surprise that overall I would recommend the WD Red SN700 when comparing it against the Seagate Ironwall 510. It's had a lot more time to bake in the oven there, yet it's come out a lot longer uh, after the other one, and Seagate certainly beat them to the punch there, and they've enjoyed a lovely year, year and a half there in the spotlight. But right now, the WD Red SN700, better late than never, but definitely the better SSD out of these two for your NAS. Thank you so much for watching. If you have enjoyed this, of course, click like. It helps me understand what about these videos you guys like and helps me make each video better than the last. If you want to learn more about these drives, see how the newer generation CA compares with the new WD, or even more news on NAS, DAS, Thunderbolt storage, and more, click subscribe and the bell to be notified. And do take advantage of the free advice section over on NAS Compares, manned by two humans, me and Eddie the Web Guy, completely free information, services, support, and more for data storage, whether you're a home or enterprise user. It may take us an extra day or two to answer your query. We are two humans with lives, but we answer every email. If you want to donate, there's buttons. Ignore them if you want. It's up to you. But otherwise, I will see you on the next video.